Hello there. It's been a minute. I've sort of been busy with work and life, but I'm back and I'm ready to talk about fearless concurrency. Um, so without further ado, what is concurrency? Well, concurrency is the ability of running, say, thing A and thing B independently of one another. Uh, but then we have parallelism, which you may have noticed is in the title of this video, which is running things A and B at the same time. So the way this usually looks in code is say you have two treads. Again, you can call them tread A, tread B, and um, they both independ they both independently run at the same time some piece of code, say to process something or you know do some calculation or whatever. You can think of treads. If this is your very first introduction to treads, you can think of them sort of as workers. You know, you have Bob and Alice both in their own independent booths. They're they're doing their work independently. And at the very same time, they're both completing their tasks, okay? But now, when people talk about concurrency in Rust, uh, concurrency, the word itself, is usually prefixed by the word fearless. Um, so why is that, right? Like, why does it have to be fearless in the first place? And the reason for that is because when doing multi-threaded programming, you can run into several issues, like um, data races or deadlocks and really just very annoying and hard to fix uh, bugs. So the reason why it's fearless in Rust is because Rust uh, type system, time checking, ownership model allows you to sort of get around all that and move a bunch of errors that in other languages you get at runtime at compile time. So, you know, you can get the compiler screaming at you, um, but you won't have any issues in, say, production. But enough talking, I want to actually show you an example of a fearful uh, C++ program and a fearless Rust program. So let's get into it. All right, so as you can see, I have two examples on my right, uh, which might be your left, I don't know. I have a fearful C++ example. And on the other side, I have a Rust example. They're pretty much equivalent in both sides. We have this print function, uh, which will iterate five times, print this variable n, um, increase the variable, sleep for a little bit. Um, and this, this function is being called by two treads, which if you don't know treads, the only thing that I want you to get off of this is that it will be running um, independently and simultaneously. And they will both, however, be acting on the same shared value. And in the end, we just join the threads, you know, to converge the results. And um, that's the end of the program. So before we run this, what are you expecting to see? Well, as I was telling you just a couple of seconds ago, in Rust, we move a bunch of runtime errors onto compile time errors. So what I'm expecting to see in Rust is, well, a run uh, compile time error. But I want to discuss the C++ side. What are you expecting to see here? Now you may think a runtime error, but that's not actually it. As in, nothing interrupts our code. Nothing panics. Instead, what we get is one of the issues that I mentioned before with multi threaded programming. It is a data race. You know, we have two threads and they're acting on a shared value. So their actions will be sort of intertwined on the shared value and the behavior is really just undefined. You know, we could get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. But sometimes we could get 0, 0, 2, 3, 4, you know. Uh, in the output printed by this. But okay, again, enough talking. Let me let me show you. So I'll just quickly build the C code. There we go. And now I will make run it. Just make final rules to make this easy. And there we go. We got oh a very pretty 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, which might almost get me to think that it's correct, but I know better. So another make run and there we go. 0, 0, 2, 3, 4. And again, you know, this is a very simple issue to see, but in, you know, big pieces of code, big uh, software architecture, whatever, these can get very tricky to diagnose without even getting a runtime error or anything in the code just sort of execute. Meanwhile, now let's run the Rust one. And no surprise here, 
we're gonna get a an error. So there you go. That is the Euler's concurrency. Thanks, Russ. All right. So we now understand the Euler's bit in Euler's concurrency. So now let's understand the actual order of half the concurrency bit. And what I mean by that is actually, you know, this is your very first time seeing multi-threaded code, understand what actual code pieces mean. So, you know, we're seeing thread spawns, we're seeing joins, what is all that? Let's understand the, the basics, even thread sleep, right? Okay, so you probably can guess this, but thread spawn, what it does is it creates a new thread. And you create a new thread by passing to it a closure so we can perform some sort of action. Again, think of treads as sort of like these workers, right? They're working um, on something. And in this case, this thread is working on this uh, print function, right? And we know this code doesn't work because of the shared value and you know the default mute, but this is the general idea of how a thread spawn works. Now, um, before we get into thread join, let's actually talk about thread sleep. An astute eye might have fact, might have noticed that the two code pieces, and that's the reason why I have this one still on the right side, are not actually the same. There's one small difference, and that is the fact that in this sign we're sleeping for 10 milliseconds, and on this sign we're sleeping for one. Why? The reason for that is because when a tread sleeps, it gives a chance to another tread to work. And uh, so what I wanted to highlight with this thread only sleeping for one millisecond is that even with only one millisecond of opportunity of the treads interleaving and messing up with each other's shared values, it can still happen, you know, and it can lead to data traces. My point with this is that if we increase it, you know, to something like 10, the output will get even more messed up. And I can prove that to you. Let's just do a make build. And building plus plus. And now let's do a make run. We get perfect output. Let's do another make run. And there we go. So you see, even now this time with 10 milliseconds, it's even messing up the spaces. You know, sometimes it's interleaving and printing output before the spaces. Sometimes we get double spaces. So to prove my point, with more um, with more hours of sleep the larger the chance is that the treads will interleave their work and will pick up uh, and you know if you're worried about data races it's a chance for data races to um, shine true all right so let's now tackle the last bit of say foreign code in our initial multi-threaded example I say initial, but as you can probably tell, uh, our code has changed uh, quite a bit. I'm going to actually close the C++ one because we're not going to be looking at it anymore. But again, as you can see, our code has changed um, quite a bit. And that's just because I want to have something that actually compiles. But before we get into it, I just want to mention that um, I did write a working version of our initial example. So if you're curious and you want to see how it works, all my code is always posted onto um, the YouTube channel. A repository that I have then logs on GitHub, so you can always go and check it out. All right, without now further ado, let's get into some joining. Okay, so just walking through the code, we can see, you know, as usual, we have our thread spawn, but this time it's now having sort of that print function has a for loop directly that prints from zero to four. So we'll get things like zero from D1, 151, two, and so forth. And then we also have a for loop that prints uh, from 5 to 6. So we'll get 5 from main, 6 from main. And we notice that both of these are sleeping. So T1 will give a chance for the main thread to interleave and vice versa. And then now we have a join, which technically we don't know what it does yet. So let's run this and see what we get. And we'll probably get what we expect. You know, we're getting 5 from main. So main kicked in first. Then we get 0 one you know sleeping so six two three four cool i feel like that's more or less what we expected right printing from zero to four and bring it from five to six so now let's see what happens when we remove the handle so i'm going to comment this out save let's run again this time of course we get a warning because t1 is no longer being used by that uh joining but now we get 
5 for main, 0, 6, and 1. So we're no longer printing from 0 to 4. And the reason for that is that we're not waiting for T1 to finish. And that's exactly what T1 does. T1, or not T1, sorry, that's exactly what join does. Join waits for T1 to finish. So let's join. Now, another thing I want to highlight is that aside from, you know, ensuring that threads finish the work they have to do before exiting, um, joining also allows us to completely, um, I guess, stop threads from interleaving. And you can do that by doing a joining in between, you know, tr two threads um, interactions. So you'll see what I mean when I run this now you'll get all the work from T1 and then all the work from main. So what you're getting is pretty much synchronous code, right? You do one thing after the other. But again, just figure it out highlight as another application of join. Okay, so now let's start getting into some of the reasons why that initial piece of code that we had didn't work. Um, there are several reasons, but one of them is highlighted right here. Um, and I modified our code once again because I wanted a, um, a thread that was actually capturing a variable from its environment. In this case, um, v, right? We're, we're using v because we're printing it. And of course, Rust Analyzer is spoiling this for me because it gets some squiggly lines. Um, so we'll get an error when we run this. But why? And the reason we get an error is that, remember, this is running concurrently with code in our main brand, um, main thread. Now, of course, our main thread really isn't doing much, right? We're just T1 joining, but it could. And for all we know, V could, you know, be dropped. You know, what's stopping me from doing this, right? From doing a drop V right here. I'm even getting a suggestion, oh no, right, because right now, um, our thread won't have V for as long as it lives, right, because V could be dropped in the name branch. So to solve this, we actually have to move V onto this thread. And now you see we're not getting any squiggly lines. And if you run this, it compiles. Just to prove to you that it didn't before, let's uh, just go V so we have that drop. Let's run this again. And you see we get an error, right? And you, we can read this just to confirm. Borrow V occurs here, borrow occurs due to user closure. Uh, move out of V occurs here, right? So that's how we use variables. It's one way of using variables from um, our environment. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is communicating in between threads. The way that Rust deals with this is through message passing. And uh, the way that the Rust book displays this is they use you know the standard library way of using it, the MPSC. Um, but we're not going to do that. And the reason is, and I want to quote Alex Crichton, you know, huge contributor to several Rust projects, said that, um, you know, back in the day, he made what is now a shameful contribution to libSTD um, with uh, STD sync and SVC. Because, good lord, um, is that module over engineered and ready for a replacement? And he would highly recommend crossbeam channel instead of STD sync MPSC. So that's what we're going to use, and that's what I'm going to teach you. All right, so I have gone ahead and I started us a new project called Message Passing, uh, just so we can start fresh. And in it, I added a dependency to the crossbeam channel. Um, now, with this in main.rs, I already crossed an example, but it's pretty simple. All we're doing is we're creating a crossbeam channel of unbounded capacity. You can think of this as sort of like a, a just a buffer in between messages, um, which are sent between a transmitter and a receiver. 
which is what this unbounded function returns. It returns a tuple with, uh, where the first element is the transmitter and the second is a receiver. And what those do is sort of self-explanatory, but you'll see that we have a tread spawn, uh, so we can communicate with the main tread. And in this tread spawn, we're moving ownership of the transmitter, and the transmitter is then sending a message, as it does as a transmitter, to a receiver, which is then subsequently receiving it and printing it in a print line. So if we run this, you probably know what we're going to get. We're going to get a good old hello world. So yeah, this is the basics of message passing. You know, you create a channel, you have a transmitter, you have a receiver, one sends, one receives. Um, and this is a pretty, you know, trivial example. But with this, you can start seeing how we can now start to perform sort of, you know, calculations in one thread and then send the result to another, you know, through a cross beam channel. You can make things like even like a chat system or really you name it. Okay, so I just want to take some time for a quick aside to discuss a uh, bounded channels. And I think this is an aside because, um, you know, with the Rust book covering MPSC and our crossbeam channel, in MPSC, the way you create channels, you just, you just say channel with really no regard to boundness whatsoever. So that's why it's an aside. Because, I mean, regardless, I still think this is important. So um, how does bounded change things? As usual, you know, we have our transmitter, we have our receiver. But the one main difference is that once we transmit this hello, because we're occupying our capacity of one, the transmit send of world blocks. So, you know, hello has to be received, but then world to be received. World will not go into our buffer because our buffer does not have capacity for it. So, you know, in this example, we just have the main thread will receive, receive, so our blocking has little concern for us. Yeah, I can just run this and you see we'll get hello world. But now what happens if I get this join here and instead I move it right here? So what we're doing now is we're telling our code to wait for this thread to finish to then run this. But now what this does is our main thread will never be able to receive our hello. So can can we ever, you know, receive the world? Let's see what happens. So running this, you'll see that we get a bunch of nothing. And again, maybe you can guess why this is, but we send the hello. We don't have capacity to send a world, so world waits, it blocks. But we're also waiting for this thread to finish to actually run this code to receive. So we've essentially deadlocked ourselves. And this is how, you know, boundness changes from unbounded. All is just blocked, and this is a demonstration of it. All right, so we're back to our unbounded channel example, um, but quite different. And that's because I want to highlight a couple of things. First one, I want to take your attention to this thread too. So in this thread, I want to highlight how ownership sort of interacts with uh, message passing. And as usual, VS Code is sort of spoiling it. But what happens when we create an owned value, a string, you know, that doesn't implement copy, send it over a thread? Do you think we can still access that value? And as VS Code has pleasantly told us, it cannot. This will say that, you know, borrow a move value. So we cannot print this. This will cause us an error. All right, so that was the first thing. Second thing I want to highlight is that we're doing a clone of our transmitter and a clone of our receiver. What this allows us to have is it allows us to have multiple transmitters and multiple receivers, which I should highlight is a difference from the standard libraries and PSC. Because MPSC stands for multiple producer, single consumer. So it does allow you to do a clone of your transmitter, but it does not allow you to do a clone of, of your receiver. So that's another difference of the cross beam channel crate. Um, and that allows you to do, you know, receive, 
from one side, sent from one side, and received several sends, several receives from different uh, transmitters and receivers. Now, the last thing I want to highlight is receive itself. So you see here I'm doing a try receive. And, you know, we were talking about boundness and unboundness, and we show how, you know, with bounded, send, can block. And what I had to mention is that receive also does block. And that's different from try receive. Try receive won't block. It will just try and receive a message. And if there is one in the buffer, we'll get it. But receive will block up until it does receive a message. So if, you know, if we were to do a receive prior to sending any messages, and we were sending messages saved in the same thread, or we we're responding to that thread at, after our receive, we would block and we would sort of lock ourselves again. All right, so, I mean, there isn't much to show here, but I'll, I'll run it regardless. Let's remove this warning. And we can see that. Drum roll. So we get Rx got by. So this is this Rx right here. It got what thread X2 sent it. Or not thread X, uh, transmitter 2 sent it. And Rx2 got empty because it tried to receive, but nobody had sent anything yet. So, yeah, a couple of things. Our ownership um, interacts with message passing, how we can have multiple transmitters, multiple receivers, and how that's a difference from MPSC, and how we can, how receive blocks. And if we don't want to block, we can use a try and receive. Okay, so we've covered message passing which is a way to transmit data across threads, but it's not the only way. So one thing about message passing that I just mentioned was that you yield ownership of a value once you send it to another thread, right? So it follows a sort of single ownership um, architecture, per se. But what if we wanted to have a shared value? You know, you have one thread accessing a value and the other one also accessing the value. Um, and as I say this, you might remember the very first example that we looked at, the one with the shared value and the print function. You know, in here, we have a shared value, you know, both of them are adding it. So sending that data doesn't quite work. We can't have single ownership. Now, how do we fix this? The way that we fix this, or at least the beginning, is by using mutexes. So a mutex is the structure that requires you to acquire a lock to the underlying data prior to accessing it. Uh, the Rust book gives a good example or an analogy um, to understand it better. You can think of it as if, say you're in a conference room and you want to ask the speaker a question. The way that it usually goes is you have to, you know, to raise your hand, you ask for the microphone, and then you can ask your question. Because, you know, someone else might have a microphone, so you're waiting for your turn. That's like acquiring a lock. The lock is like the microphone you acquire, you can speak, and then for the speaker to answer back, if you're sharing a microphone, you have to give the lock, i.e. the microphone back to them. So, okay, let's see it in code. How can we modify this example to make use of the mutex? The first thing that we do is we actually do wrap the value. We say mutex new. Now we'll have to import mutex, of course. It's within think and mutex. This no longer has to be mutable, and we're no longer passing a mutable reference. We'll just pass shared value, and of course, both here and here, we have to move. Now, like I said, we have to acquire a lock. So in our print function, we'll say that we want to have um, mute n, and there we go. Mute n, we acquire a lock, we unwrap, and at this point, we can then modify the underlying data. And the last thing we're missing is we're no longer taking a mutable reference by 932. Instead, we're taking a mutex that wraps an i32. Cool. So that's how mutexes work. Um, but now if we run this, you'll see that we still get an error. It says that the move occurs because shared value has type of mutex i32, which does not implement copy. You know, we're moving it to the first thread. So the second move is an issue. Anyway, you're thinking, okay, how does that solve our issue, right? We're talking about single ownership. We need multiple ownership here, so Mutex is not really doing anything. Uh, but like I said, this is the, only the first step to fixing the problem. The next step is by using an arc. Um, might sound familiar if um, you watched my previous video about RC, uh, the reference counting pointer. 
Uh, but you might remember from there, I said that that's not a tread safe smart pointer. Instead, we use its atomic version, i.e. ARC, atomic RC, and to solve this problem. So let's talk about that next. All right, so you can see now that I've altered the example a little bit. Well, for once, I'm bringing arc, same place as uh, mutex uh, sync. And I am now wrapping our mutex new with arc new. After that, you can see that I'm using this arc to be able to clone the shared value. And here I'm assigning it to a value, and in here I'm doing this direct clone within our uh, closure. But the main point that I want to highlight here is that regardless, you know, the way I'm cloning and what I'm doing, we are within these two treads interacting with the same underlying value. So, you know, in, in practice, this print loop is not going to print, you know, two different values of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, but instead, it will safely, you know, lock and interact with another tread to update the value and go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, as so it's uh, running 10 times. And to prove what I'm just telling you, I'm just going to run this real quick and we'll see. There we go. We get 0, 1, 2, 3, 9. 0, blah, blah, blah. And that's it. Um, together with arc and mutex, you get another way of you know, utilizing the same data uh, within threads that is not uh, message passing. And if you remember, this is actually the same example we had at the very beginning, and this is the working solution for it. So we went from, well, I guess it's the, the data example, but uh, this is the working solution from the example that we saw right at the beginning of the video. So we've come full circle. All right, so there is one last thing I want to um, touch upon before we close this video, and those are the send and sync traits. But before we get into them, them specifically, let's walk through this new example that we have. Okay, so in our main function, you see that we're creating uh, these two values or just strings uh, and the wrap within an arc. And what that's telling us is that most probably we want to share those values within uh, different threads. You know, most probably we want to clone them. But you'll notice that it doesn't have uh, a mutex wrapping. So what that indicates is that we probably don't need interior mutability. So we don't need to lock onto something to change their value. Cool. Um, now what we're doing next is we're calling pair print pair. Try and say that five times fast. Uh, so we're calling this pair print pair. And what it does, like we spoiled just a second ago, is we do call clone because we're sharing this value within two treads, you know, so we don't want to lose ownership. We want to maintain um, Rust's uh, ownership rules. And we're just printing. So value one, value two, and we're modifying. So we should get hello world, hello world, right? And then we're waiting to, we're joining them. So because otherwise the main thread will close um, before we get a chance to actually print the dots. All right, so you know, the whole point of this is to talk about the send and sync trait. So as you can probably guess, and as sort of uh, VS Code is pulling this to us, if we run it, we'll get errors. And I don't want to get too specific because it will explain it to you, but you see that it's complaining about the send and or above here, it's complaining about sync. Okay, so what are those threads? Let's go them one by one. Send indicates that a value in this case t this generic can be transferred within threads safely and sync indicates that a value can be what a reference with value can be shared within threads safely okay so why do we need them in this example oftentimes even if you're dealing with only one thread and a main thread and a generic you'll probably need to annotate it with send because we're still transferring, of course, if you're transferring values from the main thread to the thread you're spawning, uh, we're still transferring um, that value across. And so we need to tell Rust that that's safe and that's okay to do. Because as we've seen, there are some cases of things that are not thread safe. 
right? Like um, the normal RC, the, the ARC, or the ARC, and the uh, ref cell as opposed to mutexes. So that's where send comes into play. And the way sync comes into play is usually with things like ARC, you know, because we're reference counting, and so we want to make sure that our, you know, our M percent T's are uh, safe to use. So now if we annotate this with send and sync, and we run it again, surprise, surprise, we'll get hello world, hello world. And there it is. That is the send and sync traits. And that's what I wanted to touch upon on this video. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I will see you next time, which hopefully will not be in a long time. All right. Bye bye for now.